All right, um, I'm trying something new here. You know, we got a seat. This is a little bit more of a smaller room, so uh, I have a tendency to pace around, so we'll see what my nervous tick ends up being here. But uh, yes, thanks for the introduction. Uh, to introduce myself further, um, I am, I think, what I'm starting to call a weekend open source warrior. Uh, this, you know, everything I'm talking about here today, my experience in the Elixir world is outside of my employment. This has been something I've personally found interesting and just kind of dove in head first on, and here I am today. So in coming up with this talk title, I decided to throw as many buzzwords into my title as possible. I figure reactive programming, Elixir, and Rethink DB would get the talk accepted. Seemed to have worked. Um, but my intent here isn't to really, isn't to go through and describe each of those individual terms. I think we can read up on that. What I'd like to do is present a way of solving a problem that is different that's unique. I'm not sure it's the best way to solve a problem, but in working with these tools and, and applying kind of these, some of these newer ideas, I think it's definitely novel, and I think it, at the very least, will help you to rethink the way you've solved problems in the past. So to go through this, let's build something. Um, you'll notice in these slides, I have this wonderful mascot. This is the Rethink DB Thinker. Uh, he's their mascot. They have an in-house artist on the team there, and uh, they've provided me with some wonderful artwork. A um, little shout out and thanks to them. But we're going to build something. So what do we like to build? You know, one of the things we all find fascinating is data. It's always fun to take a large amount of data and try to extrapolate some interesting insights. One of the very useful sources for that is Twitter. It provides essentially an infinite amount of data for us to process and to, to play around with. And so we're going to start with a somewhat dumb question, but we'll call it, you know, simple enough. What character do people tweet most? So here's the first tweet ever, just setting up my Twitter. And it used the character T six times, far more than any other letter there. And so what would this look like if we analyzed the whole stream of tweets? If we looked at, you know, the big pipeline coming from Twitter, what do people actually <coughs> use when they tweet? I'm guessing, you know, it's the old uh, Wheel of Fortune, you know, N, T, L, R, those letters are pretty common. So how do we actually solve this? We, thinking procedurally, what we would do is we would get access to the tweets. For each tweet, we'd go through, analyze it, com characterize it as this particular type of tweet. We might then take all that data, roll it up into some pretty report of some sort, and show here's the breakdown, this is what it looks like we have. 20% of all our tweets are characterized as a T, 15% are an A, and so on and so forth. Alternatively, I'd propose that you could define that problem less in terms of here are the things we do, but here's how we transform our data. And so the flow I'd like to propose is we start with a raw tweet. That's what we're getting from Twitter. We analyze it, and it is now graduated to the magical class of the analyzed tweets. At that point, we can aggregate these together. We have our dashboard data, and then we can publish our data out to our dashboards. If we look at this flow here, these different boxes and arrows that are drawn, we can see some interesting patterns that we've all likely seen before. Um, if we look at this analyzer, we have n raw tweets coming in and n analyzed tweets coming out. This is the very familiar map function that we'll find. So for every tweet, we we perform some analysis on it, and it outputs a new analyzed tweet at this point. So then our next box is our aggregator. So we look at that box. There's two inputs, one output. You know, that kind of, to me at least, when I first see that, my first thought is this is a reducing operation. We're taking data coming in, and we're, with a feedback loop, we're applying a reducer. Now, in this particular case, for every single tweet that comes in, we're probably going to want to update our dashboard and output the interme intermediate value. And so instead of a reduce, this becomes a scan function, which is a very similar concept, but where every intermediate value is output. And then from our dashboard data, it goes into our publisher, and we publish that out. You know, this could be another map. Possibly this is an each where we're just causing side effects for every value we get. And so if we were to write this up in Elixir, we have our wonderful stream library. And it ends up being fairly simple. We have our tweet stream coming from Twitter. 
We map it by analyzing it. We scan it by updating the dashboard. And then we broadcast each resulting dashboard. And then we run the stream. Pretty fantastic that in just four or five lines of code there, we can capture the entire flow of what's going on. Now, granted, I have these magical analyze, tweet, update, dashboard, and broadcast functions that I'm referencing. But the high level of what we're doing is simple, easy to follow. This is not without its problems, though. If you look at each of these steps, there's a few interesting characteristics in performance and uh, robustness of the system. To highlight a few of them, uh, the way that back pressure works on this system is that you will not accept the next tweet from the tweet stream until you've broadcasted the previous dashboard. And so in this particular case, we do not have concurrent pipeline. We are not analyzing tweets concurrent with updating dashboard. We get a tweet, we take step one, step two, step three, and then we get the next tweet. In this case, our analysis may not be very expensive, may not be a big deal, but if that analysis was expensive, let's say we wanted to do, instead of counting characters, we wanted to get some tone analysis. We had to call out to some you know, M ML library we were using, or even an API like Watson. I actually considered uh, building this on top of Watson just to kind of see what it would be like to get the sentiment analysis. Um, ran out of time, didn't get to actually go that path. But having that parallel, parallel computation, that currency between stages of the pipeline would really be helpful here. So that's one part. Second part, what happens if we fail? This particular code here, the scan function is very problematic in that we provide an initial dashboard, we update that, and it maintains its state. But if we crash in broadcasting for some reason, this whole, this whole stream would drop, and we'd have to re restart it, and we'd lose that whatever state we had maintained. Um, assuming we can find some way to checkpoint that state and restore it, we still have the problem of we analyze the tweet, and then now you know, we're updating our dashboard. If we crash, we have to analyze that tweet again. Or maybe we lost it, and Twitter's not going to give us a new feed. And so we have some problems of durability here. And we could probably go through and check, you know, add checkpoints. And when we do crash, we go, and we have to check what the latest checkpoint was and see is there any work that we have to repeat since the checkpoint. And we lose this very compact view of our system that we're just doing these four steps, these four functional transformations of our data. So that's an interesting problem. And so I'm going to take a quick detour away from that, and we're going to talk about RethinkDB, one of the wonderful buzzwords in the title of, of the talk here. Um, I didn't mention this in my introduction, but one of the uh, areas that I've, spo I've focused on in open source has been you know, data flow programming. And somewhere al along the way, somebody recommended RethinkDB to me. And so I set out one weekend and said, oh, I'm going to play around with RethinkDB. I want to do it in Elixir. Where's the driver? And there was not a working driver at the time. There was an old driver that was outdated, didn't work with the latest version of RethinkDB. A lot of changes had happened in the meantime. And so I spent an afternoon hacking away and wrote the basic network communication piece. And if I uh, did the breakdown of my query myself, I could actually go and get data from the database. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. This is a success. I implemented one or two parts of the query language. It's a very long query language. And then, you know, like any good weekend hacker, threw it up on GitHub with, you know, a little readme saying this is just an experiment. And a week later, had a number of stars, had some issues open. People were asking why I didn't support this query or that query. And the fact was I didn't support 99% of the queries, but I'm glad they found, you know, that uh, there were two, two that I hadn't explicitly listed. Um, and so this coincided as well with a personal goal I had of last, of, for the month of April uh, in 2015, I wanted to work on open source every day. And so Monday came around, you know, I kind of hacked together the basic piece on Saturday and Sunday a few people started and were commenting on it. And so Monday came around, I said, all right, I'll start, you know, implementing the query language. And, you know, slowly but surely over that month and the next few months, the it became more and more fully baked. And, and uh, now it's, you know, a year later, it's, I've given it some time to season, um, but we're just about ready to go to our fully stable version. I'm waiting for feedback on a few other little tweaks. So that's, about, that's why I'm here talking about RethinkDB. That's my exposure. I sit here as the 
odd intersection of these two technologies, RethinkDB and Elixir, and am apparently the world-renowned expert on those two in combination. But what does it do? What is RethinkDB? Why is this interesting? Why was I drawn to it? So, um, sorry, we'll get to that in a second. So it's a document store. You know, anyone familiar with Mongo or many of the other uh, databases out there are familiar with these document stores. You provide a JSON document. You can, through various mechanisms, index into it. You can filter based on certain parameters. Um, it does that. You know, a lot, of, a lot of different databases do that. What's special here? There's a few things I found that were very interesting. One is the query language. So the query language is not a string-based query language like you might see with SQL or with Mongo. Um, it is actually a, uh, under the covers, it is a S expression AST. You know, it looks a lot like a Lisp. And it's designed so, to be baked into the client language. And so you should use native, the guidance from the company behind RethinkDB is that you should use native language constructs, native language idioms, and it should feel native in your application. And so that was kind of interesting. The query language itself is very functional in nature, and so it seemed to kind of fit with my paradigm and view of the world. Um, the other aspects of the database were is, you know, fairly easy to get operationally up and running. They have provide some great tooling on that front. It does clustering, sharding, all the wonderful things we expect from a NoSQL database. So I'll go in a little more detail here, but I'll talk about the query language. And so I've got many examples here, and uh, hopefully as we go through enough examples, you'll get kind of a, f look at a feel for what you can and can't do with the query language. So here we have the first query there. It's, you know, table people. We're going to filter on the name John. Um, this, you know, is fairly similar to, the, you know, the type of uh, function, the functions we might have in an enumerable, li enumerable library. And then here, in, in the first example, we're filtering on the key value pair of name and John. Second example, we have the ability to pass an anonymous function. And so I've bolded this keyword lambda. That's a, a macro that is part of the driver. And if you, using the keyword lambda, you can pass an anonymous function, and it will transform that anonymous function into a rethink DB compatible anonymous function. So here you can filter. You receive the person. You can do some nonsense math like only accept the people whose age is greater than the length of their name. Um, that would produce an interesting partition split among a population, to say the least. You can go farther. There's the ability within a anonymous function to have branching logic that we can actually say if the person's under the age of 13, let's mask their name. And so we would merge name private over the document merges have a, pres have a preference for the, you know, the document on the right, and so it, it would overwrite any field name name with name private. And that's actually, you know, a fairly common thing that's done. We can go a little deeper. The query language supports joins, and so we have our posts. We join against author. Um, one pattern I've noticed in many of the RethinkDB queries is that it returns a very explicit set of data. And so when you join, it returns an object with a left and a right. So you can see the two documents that matched. And then if you call zip, it will actually merge them together. So that's why we call zip there. You can do subqueries. You know, so get, we can get all the, you know, from the table of people for each person. We can fetch all the posts that they are the author of. We have to explicitly coerce it into an array. But uh, we, can return, uh, we can merge a new field of posts into the author. We can do grouping, we can do mapping, reduce. You know, sum is a simplified form of reduce, but you know, reduce is a, if anyone's familiar with Haskell, it's uh, much more similar to a monoid reduce in which you don't have control over the order of operations. That's so it can run effectively across the cluster. And so I decided, like, what is the most RequeL that I could come up with? And this is actually a fairly complicated query. Uh, it, given a group of people, or I guess given a table of, of authors and posts, how many people are responsible for uh, the posts that are, like, the authors that post more than 20 times was what I decided here. So we have kind of our classification of frequent and occasional authors. And so we go through and we can group our authors by whether or not they have posted at least 20 posts. 
Um, there's a few you know, nitpicks here. Coerce to string because later we use it as the key in, J in a JSON document and you can't use Booleans as keys. So there's a few things you kind of have to, rules you have to play by. But the idea from the group there is we're splitting it into those who've had more than 20 posts, those who've had less. And then our next uh, function there is we're going to grab the, count the author and any of their staff. They might have a list of staff, editors, people who help them. We're then going to sum that and then we call ungroup, which uh, one of the interesting things about group is any map or filter or things after that apply to each group individually. When you ungroup, it takes that, uh, all those groups and just gives you a full array, and then you can filter out individual groups and map the data in that way. Um, we then take all the values of these groups. That's you know, a quirk with how the data is returned. We can course to an object and then map that object. So at the end of all this, we get frequent, here's a count, occasional, here's another count. Um, yeah, this is a very, very complicated query, but it's actually pretty expressive. And it, you know, the, the, the data flows in a similar way as how you would write this on the client side. So what are the limitations of the database? Um, I think we, whenever we talk about a new database that comes up and clustering, we love to mention the Jepson tests. We love to mention Kyle and what he's worked on. Um, he's done some very interesting tests recently. He did a full uh, suite in, in collaboration with the Rethink DB team. They reached out and actually uh, hired him as a consultant to validate that their clustering solution, their automatic failover based on Raft, was actually doing what it was supposed to do. And so. He did his full suite of tests, and it passed with flying colors. And a pass in this case is not you never lose data. It's the documentation is correct. So if you write your data with the <coughs> correct settings, and if you read your data with the correct settings, you will never have unacknowledged rights or lost acknowledged rights. Um, and there are ways to soften those guarantees, and those meet the, you know, the documentation as well. And so that was really interesting and really kind of a good, a great sign from the you know, team that they're really thinking about these problems and not focusing on marketing material. Um, in any case, the, uh, they did a follow-up run where they did a similar set of tests while reconfiguring the database. So while adding new nodes to the cluster and, and resharding tables. And that was the first time Kyle had actually run that test against the database. No database had really gotten uh, sufficient you know, pass with flying colors on the first run to warrant a second run. And in that, they actually did find a, cor a bug on a, you know, a corner case doing some weird things, and they've, you know, since adjusted that and fixed it. Um, you know, it's, I don't expect a database to be absolutely perfect. I think we'd like it to be. In the early days, I, you know, I do understand that bugs will happen. But the fact that they are proactively trying to hunt these down, they have a very sophisticated test suite, they forked JEPS in themselves and use it as part of their own team, Pretty impressive. Um, ACID, like most NoSQL databases, we don't have full ACID. Uh, our ability to have atomic writes is limited to a single document, so you cannot have cross-document transactions in any way. You know, that lends itself to some constraints on the way you can use it. Um, CAP theorem, it's a, a CP system with automatic failover if, if the master for a given shard dies, and it uses raft election to, to elect a new leader for that shard. So now we have a little background on RethinkDB. We're familiar on you know, what it does and how we can use it. Um, there's one key piece that I've left out here. And this is, sorry, I left this out kind of, you know, the suspense building up to it. All those wonderful queries that you saw in that wonderful query language, I left out a fantastic use, which is called a change feed. And so for many queries, probably not that more complex one I had, but many of those earlier ones, uh, you are able to register that query as a change feed, in which case you will be returned a cursor, and that cursor will represent uh, the given set of documents that match that query, as well as any future documents. And so as you enumerate over it, as you consume it, um, it will block and wait for more data coming from the server. And this is really where the paradigm shifts. This is really where you start to think that was going to change the way I program. And so I would like to revisit, using RethinkDB, I'd like to revisit our initial problem and our initial solution, specifically with these change feeds. So here's our original. Once again, we, are, uh, we have a tweet stream coming in. We're mapping you know, while we analyze them. We're scanning while we update the dashboard. And then for 
each new dashboard that occurs, we broadcast it wherever. You know, that broadcast could easily be a Phoenix channel broadcast, for example, but you know, we're just going to call it a broadcast, and then we run the stream. So let's restructure this with Rethink DB. So what if each of these four stages was entirely independent? Rather than, pa than consuming data directly from the previous, what if they merely interact with our database? So the tweet streamer will write data to the database. The analyzer will have a feed of data coming that this tweet streamer wrote. It will analyze it and then write it back to the database. The tweet aggregator will get the data coming from the database, write it back to the database, then the dashboard publisher, every time a new dashboard is updated, it will receive an update and then publish that out. So to do this, we have, uh, in addition to the RethinkDB driver, there's another package that's available and that I maintain, um, which, is a which is specifically around change feeds. And so you can register a change feed with the query language at any point in time and you get a cursor. Um, the cursor would have similar problems to our original model, that uh, restarting it is a problem, you, you, know, you can plug it in, it implements enumerable, you could you know, use all the stream map functions on it directly. But as I was, as I was working with that, as I was you know, trying to implement solutions, I found that to have a, you know, a lot of limitations. Um, and so I kind of took a step back and thought, well, what's, what would, you know, what's the OTP approach? What's the way to really you know, embrace, let it crash, and allow supervision? And so I uh, came up with the RethinkDB change feed behavior. It is basically a superset of Gen Server. Um, there's two main additions here, and I, I outline them here. In the init function, um, instead of returning you know, what you normally return, uh, you return subscribe, and you provide the query, the database you'd like to use for that query, and any initial state you need in your application. And then there's a handle update call, where every time an update's received, this gets called, and it, and it uh, passes in whatever state you're maintaining. And then handle call, handle cast, handle info, terminate, those all are available as well. Um, so using that, let's go through and think about these different stages. So our tweet streamer, this is uh, consuming from Twitter. Um, by the way, this, this, all this code here is actually from, I built this application and ran this, and so um, I pulled it out and added some formatting to you know, get this to look nice. But you know, the canonical way right now in the Elixir community to run a stream is the stream runner start link you see at the bottom. And so you build whatever stream you want, and then you pass it to start link, and that gives you the ability to, it will restart it if it crashes and things like that. Um, that was done by, I believe that was James Fish who did that. And so uh, we're going to lean on that for, for this initial piece here. But we set up a filter. We're tracking some topic. Um, we, for every tweet we get, we're going to insert in our database two things. One, the text that, from that tweet, and then two, and this is a key part here, is this state field. And so we kind of talked about the state transformation. We're going from raw to analyze to then to the dashboard, so that could be recorded. And so we'll start out, we'll enter them in in the state of raw. And then we insert it, and then we get the next tweet from Twitter. You could optimize this in many ways. You could batch this and do all sorts of things. We're keeping it simple here and just processing them one by one. So that goes in your supervision tree. Off it goes, it's consuming. Something goes wrong, it crashes. It restarts, gets a new feed from Twitter, isolated, just does its own thing. So our tweet analyzer. So we had those two callbacks, init and handle info, and so we're going to go through the two of them. So here in init, we uh, establish our query. We have our tweets. We're going to filter on state raw. And so every tweet th that we've got is going to be inserted. It's going to have state set to raw. We only want those tweets at this stage. And then we call changes, and we have the flag include initial, which means any tweets, any documents that match this filter that are already there, please return them, and then send me, and then send me anything new that comes. So we subscribe, that runs, and then here uh, we have our handle update. So handle update comes in, data is an array of changes that have happened, it batches them together if many happen at a time, instead of, and, and you can tune that with additional uh, parameters to changes, but for simplicity, we get an array coming in. For each new piece of data we come in, it looks like this form. We have new val and old val. And so if you kind of draw out the Boolean truth table here, if old val is nil and new val is not nil, then we have an insert into that collection. You know, there's, a, there's a new element that was not previously part of that uh, query. 
if vice versa happens, new val is nil and old val is something, then we had an element that left that, uh, that query set. And if we have both set, an element in there was updated. Um, and so here we're, I simplified this a little bit, not dealing with the other cases. The other cases are basically ignore in, in the way we're building this. But here, if we have a new val and not an old val, it means we have a new entry in this data set. We're going to go calculate the most used character. And then we insert back into this, or we update that element. And so table tweets, we get the ID of that element. We update it. And then this is a key part here. So in our updates, we have the ability to do an atomic uh, update on that particular document in a single document. And so here, we're going to confirm that the state of the tweet is still raw. You know, this is the classic kind of compare and swap situation. If it is indeed raw, then we are going to add the fields, or add the field most used character, and we're going to update the state to process. Otherwise, we're going to do nothing and let this run. And this is some important failure characteristics, and I'm going to talk a bit more about how these things fail in a little bit. But you know, largely the idea here is that this is resilient against, one, failing midway through, and two, if you end up with a uh, situation where you have the server running twice for some reason, you're still going to have safe updates. You could have two different uh, tweet analyzers processing the same tweet at the same time, and only one will succeed, the other one will fail, it will crash when it reloads, the initial changes uh, flag that we provided before means it's going to get any new tweets. Since we succeeded in updating it, this tweet won't be processed a second time. So either it processed or it didn't. And if it didn't process correctly, this, then we're going to try to process it again. So that's our tweet analyzer. So this can run. This can crash. All, you know, it is entirely responsible for one thing, and that is making sure tweets can move from the raw state to the process state. So now we have our tweet aggregator. And so here's our init again. And so here we're filtering on state processed. And we include, you know, include initial, true, is again the flag we're shooting for. So this one ends up being a little more complicated. Because our goal here is to update a dashboard and to also update the tweet that we received and mark it as recorded, just to move it out of the state of processed and into the recorded state so we don't process it again. And this is where ACID would have been nice, would make a big difference, because we can't atomically do those things. We cannot update the tweet and update the dashboard in a single go. And so we're forced to choose between uh, what is usually referred to as at most once delivery and at least once delivery. And so either we can make sure we process it zero times or one time, or we can process it one or more times. And to make that decision is pretty easy. Um, in this case here, I'm going for at most once delivery. So when we receive the tweet, we update the state of the tweet to recorded. If we then crash before we update the dashboard here, then we, f we fail to, to count that tweet, and it just goes uncounted. Alternatively, we could update the dashboard and then update the tweet. And if we failed in between, we would count that tweet twice or three times, and it would keep coming back to the system. There's a couple ways to adjust this that um, we, we can talk about later, but this is one of those kind of realities you generally need to, need to deal with in distributed systems. And because we are not an asset compliant database, it often is a dis distributed system in, in and of itself. Um, some solutions here are you could instead do a, a CRDT, where it's, um, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But if you look at the actual update dashboard query, um, I wanted to highlight this as well. It, for our, you know, our dashboard table, we have a character dashboard, a single document. We're going to update it, and then we, base, we go through and set whatever our most used character is to we increment it or set it to zero, um, and then increment if it's not there already. Um, instead of having just a counter for each of these, you could safely do this, for example, by keeping a set of all tweets that had that character. Um, you know, set insertion is a very natural CRDT. And so if you process the tweet two, three, four times, and every time you just inserted it into that set, you'd have the same result as if you processed it exactly once. And so that is a solution here. Um, going for simplicity, I did not go with that. I also wanted the chance to talk about the trade-off that has to occur here. So we're updating the dashboard. We update, you know, we increment that value. And then we take the, ne the next element coming, and we do it again. And we just keep going. If we crash, we either uh, will have a, one, you know, a tweet at the very least 
It depends where we crash, but we may have tweets that get processed again, or we may have tweets that we don't end up processing. That's a trade-off that has kind of application semantics that's necessary. And then we have our dashboard publisher. And here we get our dashboard. We you know, request the initial changes, and then we have this squash flag saying, you know, if there are multiple changes, just squash them together. I just care about what the latest is. And then in our handle update here, this one's really easy. You know, we get an update coming in, um, we process it, and we publish the dashboard. And that's the application. And so it, to me, it was very interesting to go through that process to build this out and thinking about what, you know, what does this actually give me? What does this change? And so some of the things it does that I cited earlier were, is each of these act independently. They're their own process. And so uh, the performance characteristics can be isolated. If you have a huge stream coming from Twitter, um, you can do some things like have multiple analyzers. You can have multiple analyzers in parallel. You can carve up your ID space on that filter. And so you filter on, I only want the bottom half of IDs, and the other node's going to get the top half. And now you can process those twice as fast. You can. Uh, <coughs> Sorry, lost my train of thought for a second. Let me take a sip. Additionally, you can have multiple pipelines going on. And so in, here we had a state flag, and that flag had a single value. Imagine that instead of a single value, we had an object. And that object had character analyzer, raw. But it also had tone analyzer, raw. And it also had... Um, image recognition analyzer raw. And we had different pipelines for each of those different states. And so at any point in time, that tweet might be fully processed for the character analyzer. It might be just analyzed for the tone, you know, the sentiment analyzer. And each of these can be happening independently. So we have one ingestion process and then fan out to multiple pipelines. We have the ability for error handling. You know, one, one problem might be if we crash because of a bad tweet coming in, you know, the way that, that I've laid it out already is we will try to process that tweet again. The next time we come up, include initial means we will get any that we haven't fully processed, and then we'll fail again, and we just keep crashing, and it stalls the pipeline. Maybe we add an additional flag for number of attempts, and in our filter, we then say, only give me tweets that have number of attempts less than five. And right when we get it, we increment that value. And so we try maybe four or five times, and then by incrementing it, it's now out of our result set. We crash, we come back up, and the result set no longer has that tweet. Maybe we add another stage of the pipeline that only looks for tweets with, with that number of tries over five, and we have an air handling pipe system. We have a email it off or record it somewhere. As I've started thinking more and more about this, I've seen that by having this simple backbone of each of these being independent and not coupled together, that you can extend this, you can uh, you know, edit the code, you know, change the code for any in individual piece, you can add additional parallel processing happening. There are a lot of very, very interesting directions this can go. On the other hand, it's pretty complicated. You know, There's a lot more code than the four lines I started with here. It's bottleneck by a database. You're only going to be as fast as you can read and write to this database. Uh, I was talking to Joe Armstrong yesterday, and I asked him a question specifically about databases and uh, you know, whether he thinks people have a tendency to use them too often. And the, one of his biggest points was exactly that, that you are bottlenecking your system, an inherently concurrent and parallel system. You are serializing it through a database and bottle, bottlenecking your system. So that might be a concern, and perhaps that concern is alleviated as you have a bigger cluster and you have uh, proper sharding and replicas throughout, or you relax your uh, reading of data and allow you know, soft reads and various things. Other problems that might, that might occur, um, the fact that we had to drop a few tweets you know, and, and aggregating, the fact that we had to choose between those semantics. You know, that could be a little problematic. One solution there that uh, when I actually built this was uh, an, an additional, um, serv additional service running or just a, a, a stream running, essentially, 
with a stream interval and every so often every five minutes or so or every 30 seconds it would go through and look at all the uh, recorded tweets and re-aggregate them together and update the dashboard with a correction and so you get kind of this hybrid you have your correct path and then you have a fast update to keep it in sync so you can see roughly what's happening in real time but at the end of the day you can have this you know, as close to accurate as possible so is it better I'm not personally sure um, I think it's one of those situations where it's going to depend on your application. I can think of many applications I would build that are going to be a little lower volume. There may be some job processing queue or various things where this would be a fantastic way to design it. Overall, I think Rethink DB in general has given me a lot of tooling, a lot of ability to solve problems differently, and overall, and I think it's been a very positive experience. So that's what I'm sharing today. Thank you for listening. I'm uh, cutting this a little bit short because I know a lot of people I've talked to have had a lot of questions and wanted to give a chance to, you know, we can discuss things in more detail or you can come and ask. Um, I've also got a pile of t-shirts up here that uh, RethinkDB was kind enough to send me with, so please come by and grab a t-shirt. There were some people who tried to get one before and they seem to have stayed for the whole meeting, so they're allowed to give me the t-shirt. <laughs> but yeah, thank you very much for uh, having me. Is there any, any questions directly? Anyone have a, a question they'd like to me, you know, anything they like me to discuss in more detail. All right. Thank you very much.